smart water. Um, you gotta wonder what's so smart about it. I actually think the smartest thing was probably to call it smart water. And speaking of smart, I thought it could be fun to do a little video um, about artificial intelligence and music and talk a little bit about where we are today, where we're heading and how it's all gonna end one day. Maybe we should just start back with myself in a weird way. Um, I came to the United States 15 years ago studying artificial intelligence and music systems. Um, I created something called Microscoring for um, the Tomb Raider video game franchise. So I would make the score in all these different layers and the layers would be reassembled in real time inside of the video game so the score would adapt to the actions or interactions between the player and the video game. Um, it's not especially intelligent or anything like that. And there is maybe a point um, that's important here and that is the term AI is used very loosely nowadays because it becomes such a big hype thing. I thought it could be interesting to go back a little bit in time. Um, I started reading a little bit about the, the back history for it. Um, one of the first people to dabble with this was actually Ray Kurzweil, uh, the great inventor of the Kurzweil synthesizer. Um, I actually had both this K2500 rack module and K2000 keyboard. Awesome beautiful synthesizers, very deep and sophisticated. Um, Ray Kurzweil is also um, work, he's one of the leaders at Google's AI research today, and obviously the father of the singularity theory as well, if you're into that. Uh, first of all, would you tell the folks your name and the size of the curtain that's moving in? Oh, I'm sorry. Your name, please. My name is Raymond Kurzweil, and I'm from Queens, New York. Queens, New York. Well, panel, Raymond and I just happened to have uh, brought along this little piano here, as you see. And Raymond, in addition, also happens to have, uh, as the old saying goes, happens to have a piece of music with him. Uh, and before we show the audience what his uh, secret is, uh, we have just a few seconds for Raymond to play this piece of music. Raymond, the piano's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nicely played, and now uh, you're performance, of course, leads into your secret, so if you'll whisper it to me, we'll let everybody at home know what's up. Uh, well, that's... Ah, I see. So that's a very unlikely sounding piece of music. <laughs> Am I being super critical? No. Did you compose it? No, I didn't. Oh. Um... Did you, however, use... Were there some kind of formulas or letters or something unusual used to compose, to make up the notes of this piece? Uh, you, you could say that, I guess. $20 down, 60 to go. Henry? Was that thing written by a computer? Ah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I see. The relays write the music. They feed it into this uh, white cheese box here, whatever that is. And there are three little... Are these wires or just pieces of string? Uh, pieces of string or wires. I mean, does a message go through there or do they just pull I know, that's just uh, recording what the music, what the computer says. I see. But just to give a little bit of perspective, there's actually a Russian guy that was even earlier than him. Um, I want to say the first attempt to do uh, algorithmic music and all that stuff actually goes back to the 1950s. But one thing about AI that um, people sort of tend to not focus on or talk so much about because it's boring is um, the fact that computational power is increasing so rapidly now it's an exponential curve so while it may not seem there is a lot of movement in the 60s 70s and 80s we're actually starting to see now particularly in the last decade with the sort of new rising of really really sophisticated and powerful computers and that's amazing uh, compared to where we were just um, when i moved over here where i had nine computers and a rental farm and all that but okay that's totally geeky stuff um, there's a wonderful analogy about AI and about all these future technologies and it actually backdates to the Wright brothers um, that built the first airplanes. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that they went through a huge amount of trial and errors. Um, here's a little bit of footage uh, where you can see the different attempts that were made to make um, flying planes. And um, there was a particular one actually where they were trying to create this mechanical bird. Um, it would be the obvious thing to do, you take what you see in nature and you try to build it in a machine and that didn't go so well um, and obviously they learned that the design of their airplane was somewhat different than they thought it was going to be in the beginning and I see a lot of things going on with AI today a little bit the same way. Um, we're starting to see these early sort of iterations of AIs at, at multiple levels and we can discuss and, and admire them for what they're capable of 
Are they intelligent? I'm not quite sure, um, but there are definitely the deeper machine learning systems. For example, when you're using your phone and you're texting on it, there's actually a small algorithm that learns to detect what type of errors you're more common to do and will correct them for you as you're typing. You don't really notice it, but it's actually your phone adapting to your own preferences. So we are starting to see these AIs, or I want to call them assistive technologies, in their early inceptions and they are just helping. They're not really doing anything and for the most part we don't really notice them. Um, but they're there to support us. And of course with the advent of self-driving or autonomous cars, this is starting to take off. We're creating a new level of artificial intelligence that is somewhat capable of noticing its environment and navigate on it and all that stuff, which has been immensely complicated. Um, it's funny with autonomous cars that they've actually been promised for a while now and, and it's like every year we realize, oh my God, there's so much more complexity to this subject. Understanding urban city culture, how pedestrians navigate the roads is complicated. Now, let me segue all that together to where we are in terms of music AIs. We went back to Ray Kurzweil, that was his own thing. Computational power has been rising, so now we are starting to see the early technologies. I think the first one I ever saw, and it's probably not an AI, but it was Microsoft Songsmith, which was an early attempt to create this tool that would generate music for you and help you in your compositional process. What are you doing, Lisa? I've never heard you sing. I'm making songs with Songsmith, Dad, because it's the cool new thing. You're writing music? When did you learn how to write music? While the drummer plays along And then when Songsmith makes the music You're on your way to a song um, Not too long ago, um, this is just a couple of months ago I think um, Google released something called Google Bach Where you can make a couple of notes And um, the AI supposedly goes through works of Bach And will try to create a new composition for you uh, Let me just show how it works Even last week, there was another example by a group called Databots, where they took a music album with some really hefty heavy metal music and created a neural network that's chopping up this album in multiple ways and learning how to create new versions of the album. And it's actually streaming in real time. Check it out here. And there's another company called Iowa, I want to say, that has created an artificial intelligence tool that will create different scores for you on a website and you can then pull them into your sequencer and let that help and inspire you as well. So these are all early iterations of different artificial intelligence technologies that may or may not work in the sort of mainstream compositional process. Now, it's not necessarily going to stay this way. I think things are going to change a lot in the next decade. Another way to think of it is like Moore's law has absolutely been proven. We are about doubling processing power every year, roughly speaking. And now that we've done that for so many times, the growth right now is so exponential that it's really like within a couple of years, there's a notable improvement um, at the AI level as well. So with the future in mind, should we be afraid as composers and producers and music people? And I don't think there's any reason to be afraid. I don't think there's any indications of any tool taking over anything right now. I think in the next decade, we're gonna see these assistive or artificial intelligence technologies help us in the creative process. Um, Lightroom already has some different things. We'd be into photography and all that that's help you like just 
do things faster. And we're starting to see it in sequences as well with chord progression tools or melodic tools that can help enhance your understanding of melody and chord progressions in a faster way. Um, I pray to the day that we get a really good tool for orchestration as well. That'd be awesome. It has to be inside of the DAW in my opinion. Um, it's hard to go out to websites and drag stuff into the DAW and all that stuff. I, I prefer it all to be in one contained environment. But from my personal point of view, and this is probably because we make instruments for a living, um, I think in order to have a really like full-blown AI that can create music, it actually needs to understand some fundamentals about music that we're not remotely close to understanding yet. It could be, for example, how instruments work. It could be about compositional philosophy, um, not just music theory, but what is it with humans that make us like some things work and some things don't. I think we're at least a decade away from seeing those sort of emerging technologies that are really going to push the bar and where we really start collaborating with the AI. I have no doubt that later down the road we're going to see a transitional period first with assistive tools that's going to migrate into become more like okay I'm working on par with the AI, it's really helping me and it's taking a lot of my work off my shoulders and then eventually we're probably going to start seeing AIs that can make music better than humans can. How long is that from now? I'm gonna guess because this is where the sort of general community um, in AGI research that's human level intelligence is right now, that we're probably about two to three decades away from seeing technologies at that level. Um, but enjoy the ride. Right now we're gonna start seeing all these beautiful technologies emerge. Um, we're working on our own things in a very small way, but there's no doubt that tons of different developers are working on different aspects that's gonna help us and help improve the future and all that stuff. But all that said, there will be a point where computers are going to outmatch humans in their creative talents. Um, it's always been said that the creativity is the sort of the last bastion to be conquered by artificial intelligence. And that might be true, um, but it is happening and we can see the progression in front of us. I think it's very tangible. But I want to say let's enjoy the ride for now. I think we're going to start collaborating more with our technologies. The cell phone is already an extension of our brain in many ways. Um, but as these tools emerge and become more intuitive and integrated into our workflow, I think they're going to make more beautiful music coming out of it. And ultimately, we're going to be able to admire the AGIs for the you know, complex, beautiful art and their understanding of humans um, that we may not even possess. Um, but I do have one fear, one underlying fear that ties into AI and AGI research and how it's all developing right now. Think of when you're raising a child. If you give it the wrong set of ethical and moral values in life, you're going to have a child that's going to turn out to be somewhat messed up and they're going to carry some of those bad values into their life. If we look at the current implementations of artificial intelligence in the mainstream domain, we started with chess, then it became Jeopardy, then it became Go, which is, I think has as many moves as there's stars in the galaxy, something like that, really. like We're starting to scratch in the doors now where the AIs can mingle with intuition or understand intuition in terms of games. Um, we recently saw it just last month in StarCraft 2 where an AI completely kicked butt. It was actually interesting for any of you guys who are interested in video games. Um, the StarCraft 2 AI actually beat the world's best players and it figured out that if it could mass produce the cheapest unit and play it the right way, it would beat the player. So all common strategies for StarCraft went out the window and it was, it's just brilliant. Um, I'll link below if you want to see the video for it. But the problem is, as enthusiastic as I might seem about video games, that all these things are war games. We're teaching the technology to optimize itself and beat something else. It all comes down to that. There's no love or beauty in this thing. It's just pure optimization for winning. Um, it's the core in our human sort of DNA evolution theory, Darwinism. And I think since we might have the potential of creating technology here that becomes smarter than humans, um, if we don't feed it the right ethics and morals from the baby steps, I do fear that one day it's going to turn out to have a somewhat cynical viewpoint on humans in particular. If I look at the world right now, I say, why are you polluting? Why are you killing your own environment? Why are you taking all the resources, all that stuff? And if we program the AI or the AGI to live on evolutionary principles, it's certainly going to carry that into its own existence and think like, well, these humans are not really useful. Um, I'm not so much on the Terminator side of that analogy. Um, I'm just concerned that we might be looking at something a little bit similar to the Manhattan Project in terms of how impactful this technology is going to become. Again, we're decades away from it, but we are building the foundational technologies for now. So that's where my fear is about this. Anyway, um, this was just a little blurb about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, write me something down there, like 
give me your opinion like I'm sure there are many other examples I would love to hear and see some other examples of AI they don't have to be music related and um, this is a big discussion and we can go in many many different directions but um, this is just like my initial thoughts on, on this subject matter and I actually promised my wife not to make it too complex so forgive me if there's been too many scattered fragments of thoughts but um, this is a big subject matter and something that's impacting all of us uh, whether we see it or not in our daily lives so anyway thank you so much um, you know what? Um, I actually came back to record a proper ending to this video. I should not have ended on such a dark and dramatic note. Um, I've been working a little bit on a piece of music here for our upcoming Studio Brass. This is a super light-hearted piece of music, so it's a much more happy way of ending what could otherwise have been a dark video. But it's also a good indication of where we are right now with music technologies and deep sampling and sort of professional samples. Um, and I think when you listen to it, um, it's hard to keep in mind where we are right now and where it's going to go not too far from now. We're almost getting close to photorealism or audio realism at times and then there are other times where you can still go like, ah, I can, I can hear it's a computer, but we're not too far away. So keep that in mind and then think what would happen once these technologies become a little more artificial intelligent, a little more fluent and playable in their behavior. Uh, we're not too far away from it. So. Um,